So, here's a little bit of a, a quick Cook's tour through nuclear magnetic resonance, and it's a little bit tricky. Um, so, let's just see if we can accept a few things and move on to the analytical stage. The important thing is that what we've looked at in spectra up to this point is the movement of electrons. So, electrons moving from a ground state to an excited state, and they do that by taking in a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation. This time, when we're looking at nuclear magnetic resonance, and really the name is uh, the clue to exactly what's going on here. We're not looking at the electrons now, we're looking at the nucleons, that is the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus and how they respond to an external magnetic field. The underlying physics associated with this is really qu uh, quite complex and m involves really more quantum level understandings, which I do believe are beyond the scope of the chemistry course. Nevertheless, if we can accept a few things a little bit on faith and by all means have a, a, bit, a look at these in a bit more detail to go into a bit more depth, um, particularly if you're also doing physics because I think the two things will um, dovetail together very, very nicely. But what we want to understand is that a nu uh, the nucleus of an atom will display this um, concept or this property of spin if it has an odd mass number. And this is one of the reasons why we look at proton NMR and we also look at carbon-13 NMR. We do know, or hopefully we do know, that the most common isotope of carbon is carbon-12, but carbon-12 would be an even-numbered mass for the nucleus of carbon, so we can't use it. Um, it doesn't show the effects that we want, so we need to use carbon-13. The concept is that atomic nuclei act like small bar magnets, and this is a property, a physics property, where we um, look at the interaction between uh, electricity and magnetism, and that is if we have moving charges, they can generate a magnetic field, an induced magnetic field, and of course, if we change magnetic fields, we can induce a current. So these two things, uh, Ersted and Faraday's um, discoveries, are uh, applicable right at this tiny level as well. There are some limitations and some um, generalized assumptions that we're making here, but if you just think about the fact that little charged particles can create uh, by their movement small magnetic fields, and we've kind of explained this in terms of things like domains when we've talked about um, the magnetic properties of certain types of um, elements, for example, iron. Um, so the principle is if these little moving charges can create little tiny magnetic fields, then they can act like little tiny bar magnets. That is, they can line up in terms of a north and a south pole. And therefore, if we place an external magnetic field around these nuclei, then the magnetic fields will align. They'll either be um, directly aligned to the magnetic field, so in the same uh, orientation, and that's the lower energy one, or they'll oppose the uh, magnetic field. So they'll be uh, exactly back to front, if you like. So um, in terms of uh, them aligning with the north-south pole, if they're aligned to the external magnetic field, then they are at a low energy, and if they're um, opposed, then they'll be at a higher energy. Um, and so the higher energy because they'll want to rotate in order to um, return to that sort of uh, more ground, uh, more stable state. So electromagnetic radiation can be absorbed. Obviously, it's more likely to be absorbed by um, those at a lower energy state that can then flip into that higher energy state in the same way that we've said the electrons can absorb energy to go from a ground state to an excited state in terms of their uh, orbital shell movement. Now, if this was the only thing that happened, then that would mean that every hydrogen-1 nucleus and every carbon-13 nucleus would all give off exactly the same pattern because they would set in a similar thing, or at least they'd be close enough that there'd be very little difference between them. The problem is that with electrons on the outside, electrons are charged particles. These are charged particles that are moving. They will also have magnetic fields associated with them. They're much smaller mass, so there will be a difference in the strength. But nevertheless, this disrupts the patterns that we are likely to see, and that disruption um, gets magnified depending on how those electrons are distributed 
uh, uh, i.e. what they're bonding to. So are they bonded to uh, uh, double bonds? Are they in a high region of electron density? Are they bonded to oxygens? Is there a, a difference in electronegativity that's creating levels of polarity? There's lots of different options that we can have, and those are reflected in the different functional groups that we have, particularly around those carbon atoms. And so that's what produces these different patterns of um, NMR outputs that we see. It's a little bit um, oversimplified, I'm aware of that, but uh, and it's definitely worth having a little bit of a look. I can recommend uh, a resource called a Spectroscopy in a Suitcase. I think that's a really nice pictorial uh, representation of a lot of these different types of spectra that are really useful um, to get a little bit more detail. And obviously, there's a huge amount of stuff on the um, internet about this type of um, chemistry or physics. Uh, and so you can go into heaps and heaps of detail. But the main thing that we want to do is we want to know how to apply the technique of NMR.